Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Jyotaha Padakamalam Shri Guru Nubaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sadrajatam Sahagana Raghunatam Bhutam Tam Sajeevam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam <coughs> Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Bhutamscha Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha <coughs> Mukam Karoti Vachalam Pangam Langayate Girim Yat Kripa Tamaham Bande Shri Gurun Dinatayanam Vansha Kalpa Turubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhyayevacha Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Namaha Namo Mahabadanaya Krishna Prema Pridayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namne Gauda Tishe Namaha <coughs> Nityanandam Namastubhyam Prema Ananda Pradayani Kalau Kalamashana Shaya Janava Pataye Namaha Pancha Tatvatmakam Krishnam Bhakta Rupa Swarupakam Bhakta Vataram Bhaktakyam Namami Bhakta Shaktikam He Krishna Karuna Sindho Dina Bandho Jagatapate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari <coughs> Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Jayatam Shuruto Pango Mamamanda Mater Gati Matsarvasvat Padambo Jau Radha Madana Mohano Divyad Vrindaranya Kalpadru Madha Srimad Ratnagar Simhasana Sto Srimad Radha Srila Govinda Devo Prishtalibhi Sevyamano Smarami Srimad Rasara Saram Hi Bam Shivata Tataxtitaha Karsan Venu Svanair Gopir Gopinata Shrivestunaha Brindai Tulsi Devai Priyayu Keshavasracha Krishna Bhakti Prade Devi Satyavachai Namo Namaha <coughs> Bhaktiya Vihina Aparadha Lakshai Kshiptashtraka Madi Taranga Madhye Kripa Maitvam Sharanam Prabhanna Vrinde Namaste Charanaravindam Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vas Adi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare <coughs> For my unlimited Dandavat Pranams, my Shraddha Pushpanji, at the lotus feet of my most worshipable, beloved Gurudev, Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Vishnupad, Paramahansa Astatarashata, Sri Srila, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta, Swami Maharaj, Srila Prabhupada. And Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Vishnupad, 
Paramahansa, Astotara Sata Sri Shiva, Bhakti Vedan Janarayana Goswami Maharaj, and Nitya Lila Pradishto Vishnupad, Paramahansa Astotara Sata Sri Shiva, Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Goswami Maharaj. <clears throat> then I offer my Dandavat pranams to the lotus feet of all my Sri Sri Rupa Nuba, Guru Varga, and my Dandavat pranams to all the Vaishnavas and all the Vaishnavas. So, for the devotees that are tuning in online, uh, today in the United States of America is um, a day, it's a holiday when people uh, come together, their families come together for celebration kind of mood. And it's called Thanksgiving. It's to give thanks. To who? To give thanks to God. This is an actual religious holiday celebrated from the very beginning of the founding of this country. When the first <clears throat> settlers came from Europe and they settled on the East Coast. So since that time, for, you know, a couple of hundred years, uh, this, uh, this is, has become a national holiday, Thanksgiving. And then shortly after this Thanksgiving Day, then the Christmas season starts and accelerates with all the shopping uh, and the, you know, desire of the people to buy so many items and presents and, uh, and that becomes the main atmosphere. And at the same time, there is a holiday kind of mood that is being promoted, uh, Christmas, uh, and singing Christmas songs. Some of them are, have no mention of God at all. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, like this. A lot of sentiment. And some of them are speaking about Jesus, how this is his birthday. So when I grew up, from childhood, I went. I was sent to a Lutheran Christian school called Jerusalem Lutheran Christian School, and so for nine years, from my kindergarten until eighth grade, I attended school in that grade school, and uh, we did. We we continuously studied the Bible, and uh, sung different hymns from the Lutheran hymnal book, and uh, especially at Christmas time, there was very much focus on Jesus Christ, how he was born in a manger, you know, um, and how the three wise men came from the East, they bestowed gifts and so forth, and in my house, and in most people's homes, there was a Christmas tree. Did you have in your house? Yeah. So you're not American unless you get a Christmas tree, even if you don't believe in Jesus or Christianity. But true. Christmas tree has to be there. We've had Christmas trees in here in the past year. Yeah, yeah. And I've seen. And even when I was a householder, <laughs> there had to be a Christmas tree there. You know, for the kids to kind of identify with a little bit. Um, and the decorations. So many ornaments. Very very beautiful decorations and also strings of colored lights and and they, they invented so many things that you can put on the Christmas tree to spray to make it kind of look a little bit like snow, you know. And uh, so that, yeah, so, but underneath the tree, my parents and, and also on some like, some other, shelving, they would put these little figures uh, of small little, um, no, 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 not elves, the, 
This is like Jesus Christ. It's called nativity scene. Nativity. A nativity scene where where there's like the the manger and born in a in a cow shed or something. Oh, that. Yeah, and then and then he's there as a baby. Mary and Joseph are there, and then the three wise men and the camels that they came on. And so there's like a whole little diorama exhibition like that, you know, to remind us like that. You know, and uh, then, of course, um, from the other angle, from the materialistic angle, those who have no relation or have no belief or anything in Jesus, well, they made a separate entire celebration of the holiday season, you know, because, like yeah, like, the you know, New Year's is another week away, you know, so, so that's between Christmas and New Year's. But now they start in the middle of November with, with the Christmas sales and very much materialism. And then when you go shopping, um, then you hear on the sound systems everywhere, you hear Christmas carols. Christmas carols. And what is that? Well, it's different songs, you know, about the joy and the season of Christmas. Of course, in the Areas where there's snow, then it, then there's much more udipa <laughs> <laughs> stimulus for that. Okay. I I never celebrated a Christmas in a place that doesn't have snow. That so. was in my childhood always. So snow was there on the ground always, and that's why they wrote a song called "I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas." Because without the snow, then it doesn't have all the bobs, all the moves. <laughs> you see. Yeah. They would even call it Xmas. Yeah, that's uh, that's what they did. They actually crossed out the name of Christ with an X. X yeah. Is that what it yes. is? Yeah. X yes. I always yeah. thought it was like supposed to be like that for a T for, for cross. No. Just take out Christ? They put literally just crossed out Christ and put, oh yeah. my gosh, how right. terrible. Yes. Yeah. There's also sections of people, I don't have to mention their names, of their groups, but they hate Jesus. Okay. So anyway, there's a whole history from Europe, how this came to be, that date. It's not actually the date that Jesus appeared, but it, it had to do with certain political things, and, and they, had, they had ancient um, um, pagan, pagan religions and, you know, and different holidays and stuff that were celebrated uh, without connection with Christianity, right? But there, there was a desire by the Roman Empire to replace those pagan with uh, Christian dates because they adopted Christianity as the religion of the state. You know, so, um, so in this way we grew up. And then, of course, there's, <laughs> there's the legendary Santa Claus. Christmas stockings. Christmas stockings, yeah, which has to have candy in it. Or coal. Or coal. Yeah, or coal. <laughs> and, you know, then there's the movies. All the movies. Every single Christmas time. Hollywood produces some movies about, you know, that whole, the whole genre of, of the, all the fun and everything that they can have during that time, Christmas time. You know, so everything is set up in the West, in the materialistic civilization, to make more and more money off of the people's desire to celebrate that time of the year. Um, yeah. And so uh, I was remembering, because after I left the grade school, then I went to high school, and that was uh, from 19... 66 until 1970. 1970, I turned 18, and after getting out of high school, then I met the devotees and became a devotee. But during that four years, that was the peak of the hippie movement, you know, the peak. 1966, 67, 68, 69. Summer of Love. Summer of Love, 67. But we have many new special holidays because we have a whole nother, uh, you know, historical references of Srila Prabhupada coming. 
during that time and preaching and starting everything, you know. But in uh, when I joined the temple, there was absolutely no mention whatsoever about any Christmas holiday or Easter or Thanksgiving or anything. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Right? Nothing. No. Nothing. You know? And we did not miss it. No. no. <laughs> because our whole life was celebrating and dancing and singing and chanting and chanting the actual names of God. <laughs> the, the actual eternal nomenclature of the absolute truth. Hearing Srimad Bhagavad Gita, you know, Bhagavatam, this is our meditation, you know. So, yeah, all during that time, 10 years, I was Brahmachari, then became Grihasta in 1980, and then another 10 years went by. And mostly in, for the first half of that, I was in the temple still, and preaching, and part of the institution, and then bye-bye because of Srila Sridhar Maharaj. And then, uh, yeah, and then uh, I moved up here to Badger. And at that time, there was a community of devotees, some of the ones that are still here, but um, we were not so much organized, really, as a temple or anything like that. But everyone was friendly. And we would come together maybe for like a janmastami or something like that, you know. But we were divided because there were the more iskan oriented people and there was the people who were the outcasts. You know, Sri Srila Sridhar Maharaj and all of that. Then Gurudev, then he came. But I remember during that time that I, um, because having children and the, the family life, so it was somewhat necessary just to have that kind of have Christmas tree there and so forth like that. But it did not appeal to me. And I remember, I specifically remember, around when I was, maybe that final year in high school, when I was 17, and uh, the Christmas season came. And I remember going out to see some friends on that evening. And I came back and parents were gone, my sisters were gone, I turned the television on, and it was the story of Jesus, you know, one of the movies that had been produced about Jesus, the whole story of Jesus and his crucifixion and the whole thing. And I was watching it and I felt so empty in my heart. I can remember that time, almost like a sadness. Like, you know, there's so much hype <clears throat> and, you know, the celebration you know, but there's, but it, nobody's thinking about God. Nobody's thinking about Jesus, you know. So then, um, yeah, so that was some moment in time, which I'm sure from previous life, some scars, some feelings were coming up in me like that. You know, so, um, but the act of giving thanks this is an important subject matter. Um, I was uh, reading a Facebook post, somebody posted on my page, about uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur Jaivadharma. And there's a couple of paragraphs there where he's talking about, you saw that, yeah. where he's talking about gratitude. How gratitude is one of the main qualities of a pure devotee. You know? One of the main qualities is gratitude. And he was he's explaining there that without this, no one can properly make spiritual advancement. Without that mood and feeling of gratitude. And there are so many places in our shastras where prayers are spoken by pure devotees, by elevated personalities, and expressing their gratitude to the Supreme Lord. So then I began thinking, 
But what do we really feel? What what is what is the main uh, the main things that we should be expressing uh, from from the core of our heart toward Krishna? What do the pure devotees express? And then I remembered a verse. Um, it's one of my favorite verses, although I, I haven't memorized it exactly. But it's from the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. And it's spoken by Uddhav. And so we know that in the 11th canto, uh, Uddhav met with Krishna before Krishna left the planet. And there's something like 30 chapters in that 11th canto uh, and about 23 or 24 chapters are all the conversation that Krishna had with Uddhav. Mm -hmm. Yes, very, very important. And actually, it's called the Uddhava Gita. Just like Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, so Krishna spoke this song, this Gita, to Uddhava. And it contains some of the very most important teachings. Uh, Srila Gurudev, he used to say that uh, one has to read the 11th canto after reading the 10th canto. Because it's very essential to put everything into proper perspective. Just like yesterday we are talking about vairagya, renunciation and knowledge. Vidya, vairagya, vidya. So, anyway, there are so many different subject matters covered in the 11th canto. Uh, in all those chapters where Krishna is teaching Uddhava and speaking what is essential because he's just about to leave the planet you know, at the end of Krishna's pastimes winding them up and then in a very lonely secluded place Krishna meets uh, Uddhava and he's underneath a tree there's a painting they painted of that him sitting also um, Maitreya Rishi happens to come there as well. Mm. So Maitreya Rishi was not the person to whom Krishna was speaking, but he was hearing. Just like Shukadeva Goswami spoke to Maharaj Parikshit and everyone else heard. So in this case, Maitreya Rishi was so um, fortunate that he came there at that time somehow. And he got to hear the entire Uddhava Gita. So after the pastime, then Sri Krishna left his, left his uh, our material vision. And Uddhava was wandering in extreme separation mood. And upon his wandering on the pathway, he met Vidura. So, you know, Vidura is part of the Yadu dynasty family, very elevated personality. And in actuality, he's an incarnation of Yamaraj mm -hmm. in Krishna Lila, you know. And so Vidura met Uddhava and he had a conversation with Uddhava. And he was inquiring from Uddhava because he could see that Uddhava was very, very distraught. And his heart was so agitated. And then Uddhava began to remember Krishna, to remember his pastimes in Vrindavan. That's in the third canto. And there's a chapter there called um, Remembrance of the Vrindavan Pastimes. So then Uddhava informed Vidura that Krishna had now left the planet. And he told Vidura that before leaving, he spoke to me all these things. So then Vidura wanted to hear it from him. But Uddhava did not want to transgress the proper maryada etiquette. Uh, because uh, Uddhava was much younger than Vidura. And so there was a certain maryada there. So, and there was a, a senior person to him, namely Maitreya. Although Uddhava was much more intimate relationship with Krishna. He's one of his eternal associates. He's, 
has a much, much more intimate relationship than Maitreya Rishi. But Maitreya Rishi was senior and also very accomplished transcendentalist. So he referred Vidura that you should go to hear from Maitreya. He heard everything. And, uh, and then he sent him there. And he did hear so many chapters of the third canto are Maitreya Uvacha. So, you know, Vidura is hearing from him. But so in eleventh canto, this is so in eleventh canto. This is when this this talk between uh, Uddhav and Krishna is taking place, and Maitreya Rishi is there hearing it. Mm. But it kind of like goes back to third canto is when the conversation between Uddhav and Vidura yeah. and Vidura uh, Vidura is told to go to Maitreya Rishi. That's right. My my brain's just trying to conceptualize yeah, yeah. eleventh canto. Time wise, yeah. the eleventh canto comes much much later. Yeah. And, the, and the story of Uddhava hearing. But as we're hearing from the first canto, you know, then the second and third, and then third canto, that's when this, uh, mm. that's when the scene is set that Vidura is hearing many important topics from Maitreya Rishi. So it's not so linear. <laughs> no. There's a lot of things that are, are not in chronological order. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a particular flow, there's a particular subject matter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, just like in the first canto. Yeah. You know, then we hear about Narada Muni, you know, yeah. uh, speaking to Srila Vyasa Dev and inspiring him to write the Srimad Bhagavatam, mm. you know. And uh, then there's chapters in the first canto which are talking about uh, the battle of Kurukshetra and after the battle the birth of Maharaj Parikshit, prayers by Queen Kunti Dev, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's like a scene. Some parts of the Mahabharata are drawn in there, you know. Mm -hmm. And the Krishna, the character of, of who is this personality Krishna, are set in that context mm -hmm. of his pure devotees because they knew, they understood who Krishna is, you see. So in this way, the Bhagavatam gradually builds different subject matters. There's actually a verse that talks about the ten subject matters in oh. Srimad Bhagavatam, yes. And each canto, because each canto, you've probably heard, that the Srimad Bhagavatam is the rasa swarup of Krishna. It's actually his, his form, his spiritual form. And the first canto represents his lotus feet and gradually comes up to the tenth canto which is Krishna's smiling face, mm -hmm. like that, you know. So, what I was going to say is that there's a very wonderful, wonderful verse spoken by Uddhava to Krishna in the last chapter. Uh, and he's taking that opportunity to express his gratitude to Krishna. And so, I'm going to read that. It's a, it's a well-known verse. Okay. This is the sixth verse of this chapter. And then in this chapter, it's called Bhakti Yoga. It's the final chapter. And Uddhava is, for the first few verses, before the sixth verse, Uddhava is addressing Krishna and telling him that what you've spoken is not so easy to follow. <laughs> because Krishna actually gave the system of Ashtanga Yoga and the system of Jnana Yoga, and he explained all these things. Then he requested Krishna, can you please give the most simple way that in a person who's not so advanced can follow that in his life and attain perfection. So this chapter is titled Bhakti Yoga. And Krishna is giving this. But in the beginning of the chapter, when he's asking Krishna to <coughs> speak this, he now he now declares 
to Krishna, the feelings of his heart and his realization of gratitude. Because gratitude, as I said, is very essential for a devotee. For any pure devotee has gratitude. Even the Supreme Lord, Krishna, that's one of his prime qualities. He is always grateful for whoever does any service. Supremely grateful he is. Mm. So the pure devotees are like that also. Here's the verse. Spoken by Uddhava. Naivo payantya pachitim kavayascha vesha brahmayusha pikritam riddha mudaksmaranta yontar bahista nubritam ashubham vidunvan acharya chetya vapusha svagatim vyanakti. I'm going to say the synonyms you can repeat after me. Na eva. Na eva. Not at all. Not at all. Upayanti. Upayanti. Are able to express. Are able to express. Apachitim. Apachitim. Their gratitude. Their gratitude. Kavaya. Kavaya. Learned devotees. Learned devotees. Tava. Tava. Your. Your. Isha. Isha. O Lord. O Lord. Brahma Ayusha, Brahma Ayusha, with a lifetime equal to Lord Brahma's, with a lifetime equal to Lord Brahma's, api, api, in spite of, in spite of, kritam, kritam, magnanimous work, magnanimous work, ridha, ridha, increased, increased, muda, muda, joy, joy, smaranta, smaranta, remembering, remembering, yaha, yaha, who, who. Antaha, Antaha, within, within. Bahi, Bahi, outside, outside. Tanubritam, Tanubritam, of those who are embodied, of those who are embodied. Ashubham, Ashubham, misfortune, misfortune. Vidunvan, Vidunvan, dissipating, dissipating. Acharya, Acharya, of the spiritual master, of the spiritual master. Chaitya, Chitya. Of the super soul, of the super soul, vapusha, vapusha. by the forms, by the forms, swa, swa. Om. Om. gatim, gatim, path, path, vyanakti, vyanakti. shows, shows. Naivo payantya pachitim kavayas tadesha, brahma yusha pikritam ridda mudas maranta, yontar bahis tanubritam. Ashubham vidunvan acharya chaitya vapusha svagatim vyanakti. <clears throat> you can repeat, O oh my Lord, O oh my Lord, transcendental poets, transcendental poets, and experts in spiritual science, and experts in spiritual science, could not fully express their indebtedness to you. Could not fully express their indebtedness to you. Even if they were endowed, even if they were endowed with the prolonged lifetime of Brahma, with the prolonged lifetime of Brahma, for you appear in two features. For you appear in two features, externally as the Acharya, externally as the Acharya, and internally as the Super Soul, and internally as the Super Soul, to deliver the embodied living being. To deliver the embodied living being. By directing him how to come to you. By directing him how to come to you. I'm reading this again. <clears throat> oh my Lord, transcendental poets and experts in spiritual science could not fully express their indebtedness to you, even if they were endowed with the prolonged lifetime of Brahma. For you appear in two features externally as the Acharya and internally as the Super Soul, to deliver the embodied being, living being by directing him how to come to you. So this is what Uddhava is expressing and making an attempt 
to show his own gratitude to Krishna, but he's also stating that no one could possibly express to you sufficiently thanks to you, gratitude to you. He's saying that even the topmost uh, experts and, and poets, kavis, who can, who can, you know, spontaneously compose beautiful Sanskrit prayers and verses and all of that, these transcendental poets and these experts in spiritual science, they could not fully express their indebtedness to you, even if they tried even if they were endowed with a prolonged lifetime of Brahma. That's pretty long time. You know? Even if they were endowed with that amount of time in order to make this attempt to express their indebtedness to you, they would not be able to. They could not fully express. And why? What is it about you that you have done for us, that we could never, ever, what to speak of repaying, even just to thank you, even just to express how much we are indebted to you. Why? Because of two things. You appear, you, my Lord, appear in two features within this universe, within this world, within this material creation. You appear in two features. One of them is external, Bahi, as the Acharya. Sakshad Hedithvena Samastra Shastra. You appear as the Acharya, and your other feature, inter internally, Antar, you appear as Paramatma as the super soul. Chaitya Guru. And what do you do in these two forms? You deliver the embodied living beings by directing them how to come to you. There is no other gratitude that could ever match this uh, particular expression what the Supreme Lord has done for all of us fallen living entities. Aside from this, there cannot ever be anything as great uh, and as worthy of our thanks and gratitude as this. Because if he didn't do that, if he did not do that, if he did not come, externally and manifest in this world as the pure devotees and the acharya that's a, that is a type of guru tattva guru tattva means bhagavan himself is doing this coming and if he was not situated in our heart where would we be he's always with us in our heart he states that very clearly in the Bhagavad Gita. I am the heart of every living entity. And I am directing their wanderings. And from me comes all knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna states this. Our spiritual life, whatever we've come to in the course of our wandering and material existence, lifetime after lifetime, has come to some level of, um, of achievement in one sense, of, of attainment, only because of this. On our own, we have no qualification at all. But Krishna, in these two ways, arranges to deliver all of us, the embodied living beings, by directing him how to come to you. You know, Swagatim Vyanakti. Swagatim means his own path. How to come onto the path to him. Vyanakti means he shows it. So, there's just a couple of lines here 
that were extracted by Hridayananda Nanda Maharaj. I don't have other purports. He, you know, he's the one with the group of devotees that completed the 11th and 12th canto and so forth. But he's quoting from Jiva Goswami, and then he's quoting from Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. And this is something very, <laughs> pretty amazing, what they are saying. So according to Srila Jiva Goswami, Lord Krishna is 10 million times more dear to a devotee than life itself. Why? Why is Krishna like that? Why does a devotee have such extreme love and holding Krishna be, to be dearer by 10 million times than his own life. Why? What is, what is it about that? Can, can you say anything? What it may be? Why? The gratitude? Right, but but why is it that way? That Lord Krishna is literally 10 million times more dear to a, a pure devotee than life itself. Because Krishna is the soul of our soul. In the Bhagavatam it said, Atmanam, Atmanam. He is the Atma of the Atma. We don't realize that because we're covered by Maya and we're always looking for other objects of our affection and so forth. But those who are pure devotees, they have fully realized how Krishna is the object of all love. All love. And we always hear about Srimati Radhika being the extreme most beloved and attached to Krishna than anyone else. That is even beyond conception. And even, but even the, the jiva, the jivatma, Krishna is our real, true, beloved and friend. He states that in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, where he says, anyone who understands me as the supreme enjoyer, Right? Bhaktaram Jagya Tapasam Sarva Lokam Ishvaram Sugritam Sarva Bhutanam Yadvamam Shantim Rutati. So he's saying, anyone who understands me in three ways, he will attain Shanti, complete peace. First one, I am the supreme enjoyer. Which means what? We're not the enjoyers, he's the enjoyer. It's it's uh, reversed for the conditioned soul through the Maya potency because the conditioned soul wants to attempt to become the enjoyer and no one can because constitutionally we are the enjoyed, we're property and he is Purusha, you see. We're Shakti, he's Shaktiman. We are meant to be enjoyed by him and being enjoyed and uh, rendering service to him is our natural function. It's our natural function, you see. So, uh, the pure devotees, they truly embrace Krishna within their heart with such extreme love and attachment we cannot even conceive. Because they realize the truth. We will one day realize that because we're the eternal part and parcel of Krishna. That's going to happen to us. It will happen gradually in stages. It can't happen all of a sudden because Krishna wants that we will use our free will. He will never intrude on our free will. And it must be that way. So therefore Krishna uh, has a system by which the jiva will gradually wake up and he'll gradually realize Sambandha Gyan, how he has a relationship with Krishna and how that relationship is so far beyond any other relationship. Uh, 
And this is the natural, the natural position of every single jiva, every single jivatma, who his tatashta shakti, were meant for his service. So the whole, the whole arrangement of this material creation and all the planetary systems and all the species of life and all the higher and lower positions that the jivas can attain within this world, this is all simply for one purpose, that we will gradually come to realize that we're not the enjoyer and Krishna is the object of all enjoyment. We are meant for him. And when we surrender to that, then there's no more anxiety. Like Krishna says, I'm the supreme Voktaram Yagya Tapasam. I'm the enjoyer of all efforts of all living entities. Sarva Loka Maheshwaram. I'm the supreme controller of all planets, of all demigods. I am that. And the most intimate thing is that Suhridam Sarvabhutana. I am the well-wishing friend, the Suhrit. I am your friend in your heart. You just have to turn to me. The two birds in the Upanishads, there's described two birds are sitting on the branch of a tree. One bird is very preoccupied trying to eat the fruits that are there on the tree. And he's looking here and there, but he doesn't notice that sitting next to him is another bird. But that bird is Atmaram, that bird is self-satisfied and he's only watching his other friend bird. That's us, yeah? And he's waiting. Oh, when will my friend turn toward me and notice that I'm here and then we can have a relationship? This is Krishna. How merciful that he manifests in our heart as the Paramatma. And he's waiting. And he'll wait for millions of lives. He'll wait for any length of time. Uh, he is the overseer of everything. And the permitter. Those two functions. He permits according to our karma and so forth. He doesn't intrude. But he's waiting. And when the living entity becomes fortunate, after wandering and wandering, then he meets Guru and he receives Bhakti Lata Beach. Guru Krishna Prasade Pai. So at that time, his spiritual life begins and he becomes gradually, gradually enlightened, understanding and experiencing that I should, that there is no other purpose. There is no other reason for my life. There is no other goal of my life, only this, to attain my relationship with Krishna. So according to Srila Jiva Goswami, Lord Krishna is 10 million times more dear to a devotee than life itself. Now, next, we will hear what Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says about this. And according to Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, even by rendering devotional service for the total duration of 1,000 universal creations, now, what is that? That means... <laughs> the life of Brahma, right? Yes, 1,000 lives of Brahma. So he's saying that the devotee, according to Vishwanath Chakravarti, even by rendering devotional service for the total duration of 1,000 universal creations, a devotee cannot repay the debt that he feels to the Lord for having awarded him loving service to the Lord's lotus feet. The Lord appears within the heart as the super soul and externally both as the spiritual master and as his literary incarnation, the supreme Vedic knowledge of Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. So this is real thanksgiving. <laughs> you know, this is truly nothing can compare with this ever, ever, ever. So, 
we should take heart from this. And we should, we should know that we can't do it by ourselves. Only Krishna can help us to do it. Only Guru can help us. But if we're submissive to them, if we become obedient to them and not rebellious, they can make the arrangement. It will happen. It takes some time. It takes some time. But we're not so far away uh, from that. Sometimes we may feel, but actually not. Because we're very close. In this life, we've come to the lotus feet of pure Vaishnavas. You know, and we are living our lives, trying the best that we can to follow their instructions. Not always successfully, but trying. And that sincerity is the main principle. That's why my favorite state, one of my favorite statements by Shiva Bhakti Rakshak Sri Maharaj, and I always tell, whenever I quote this, I say, this should be written on a huge banner. And <laughs> it should be like one of the, one of the most exalted proclamations uh, of our philosophy. What is that? Three words. Sincerity is invincible. Have you heard that? Mm -hmm. I love this quote from Shri Sri mm -hmm. Sincerity is invincible. Mm -hmm. What does the word invincible mean? Nothing gets through it. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing breaks it. Unconquerable. Yeah. Invincible. Krishna is describing in the Gita, you know, in the very beginning about the Atma, how the Atma cannot be cut into pieces, cannot be burned by fire, all these things. He's describing the eternal spark of consciousness, the G Atma, right? So just as much as the Jivatma is literally invincible, although he can be covered temporarily by Maya, but he can never be destroyed. He's eternal. So, Srila Sridhar Maharaj always liked to describe this uh, conception, which actually comes from the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. You know, in the sixth chapter, there's a whole discussion about Krishna's describing to Arjuna about Ashtanga Yoga and how she should go to the bank of a river. And he describes each step put kusa grass and deer skin and soft cloth and sit down and then, you know, focus your eyes, you know, on the tip of your nose and like so many instructions he's giving. So, <clears throat> after Arjuna hears that, how does he respond to what Krishna just taught him? That's, that's harder to control than the... <laughs> he, he says... I have a doubt. I have a doubt. Because what you're describing seems in difficult and um, intolerable. Something like that he, he expresses. To do. Uh, and, and to control the mind is practically like trying to control the wind. Arjuna says... And then Krishna responds to that by saying, yes, it's true. It's very, very difficult. But it's possible by two things. Constant practice and detachment. These two things. Constant practice and detachment. So then Arjuna, he says, but I have another doubt that <clears throat> in order to do this, <clears throat> a person will have to give up everything that they're doing in their life in order to take this up, this pathway of Ashtanga Yoga that you just described. Mm -hmm. For a person to come on the transcendental pathway, he'll have to leave all worldly activities and consciousness and everything. Mm -hmm. Right? So then he says, so... 
what happens to a person who did that and they gave up everything, but in course of time, their mind become influenced by worldly consciousness and they fall from the pathway. Oh, my dear Krishna, please tell me what happens to that person because it looks like in the sky when there's a mass of clouds that one part of clouds breaks away from that mass of clouds and goes just blown wandering off into the sky like a riven cloud right and he has no position in any sphere this is what Arjuna expresses so then Krishna says Arjuna let me tell you what happens to such a person that person who has made the endeavor on this pathway of yoga which means trying to find his relationship with the Supreme. That's what yoga is, is to try to find your relationship with the Supreme. So that person who has made that endeavor, uh, he will not become like a ribbon cloud, no. In his next life, he will take birth as one of two types of uh, in one of two different types of families, he will take his birth. One family is rich, aristocratic family. And the other, fa the other birth is a family of very high transcendentalists. Hmm? Krishna also says you will not, not be overcome by evil. Well, that's coming. Oh, that's, that's coming. Not, that's <laughs> not, that's not, okay. Yeah. So first he says first. <laughs> first he says this and then then he says by dint of his yoga practice from the previous lives he will automatically become attracted to the yoga principles and he will again take that up and then in course of time by practice he will attain perfection then Krishna says a mantra to Arjuna which is what Srila Sridhar Maharaj would repeat, this one line. Nahi kalyana krit kaschid, durgatim tata gachati. He says, my dear Arjuna, one who tries to do auspicious activities, kalyana krit, in other words, he tries to do good. Nahi kalyana krit kascha durgatim tata gachati. He can never go to a durgati, to a bad destination. And in Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, he has translated that as one who does good can never become overcome by evil. His intention to do good, and he tries. That person cannot be overcome by evil. And this is where Srila Sridhar Maharaj gives the three words line in English. Sincerity is invincible. Is there a definition of sincerity? Yes, there is. But just taking that from what Krishna told him, a person who tries to do good, we can even see that in our ordinary life. We can see how there are some people that are inclined, they're sincere, they want to do good for others, you know? They feel sorrow to see people suffering and so forth. They're not transcendentalists necessarily, huh? but they're good people, they're good-hearted people. They have some moral character and like this, you see. They're on the side of the pious. Those who are quite opposite to that are, they have the qualities of the asuras. That's described by Krishna in the 16th chapter. So what Srila Sridhar Maharaj, how he's derived this statement is that Krishna is assuring Arjuna 
Arjuna, don't worry. A person who tried to come on this path, that is the proof that that person is sincere. They're Kalyanakrit. They want to do good for themselves and good for others. They're Kalyanakrit. Kalyana, you know? Gurudev would say, Kalyana Bhavatu, Kalyana Bhavatu. He would give that blessing, holding up his hand in the blessing. Kalyana means, may everything be auspicious for you. May everything be auspicious, Kalyana. You see? Aus the highest auspiciousness is the progress of our soul towards the Supreme Soul. Bhakti. May Bhakti come to you. You know? So what Srila Sridharaj told, I, when I, you know, heard this so many years back, decades actually, it was very encouraging to me. Because we're not always in a position that we can accomplish or do or, um, or actuate in our life what we would like to be able to do. And Srila Sridharaj said one other thing that is in direct relation with that. He said, you don't, you judge a man. How do you judge a person? You judge them by their ideal, he said. What does, what does ideal mean? Their goals? Or well, what it, their intention? Yeah, like, you had intention. Like, you, you have something that you hold within your heart, mm -hmm. within your mind. I would like to be like this. This is my ideal. You know, I want to become like this in my life, or I want to, you know, like that. Ideal. It's not what I've already attained, but it's what I hope to attain. My, my asha, my hope, you know, it lies in this. And my ideal is that one day I can be like this. Mm. And the Shiva Shiva said, that's how you judge a person, by their ideal, not only just by what they've achieved. I really like that. Yes, I do too. Or, or their behavior? Well, the behavior is what they're striving. But a, a person may be stuck, you know, may... Be you also use the mic? Mm -hmm. But the body may become illusioned and yeah. off the path and engage yeah. in so many bad activities, yes. but he, you can still judge him by his ideal. Yes, because what Krishna already told, he's a Kalyanakrit. He fell from the pathway. Right? Yes. That's actually the question of Arjuna. If the person falls away. So Krishna, uh, he's ignoring pretty much the fallen condition of that soul, because that soul has sincerity. They had sincerity enough to try to come on the pathway. Krishna never forgets that because he is grateful. Krishna is grateful to every little endeavor that the jivas make. You know? So, these two points are very related with the topic of trying to express our gratitude to the Supreme Lord. You know? And how Krishna makes the arrangement to bring us to another life and to a, another birth and arrange everything so that it's helping us, it's, it's auspicious, so that we can actuate our ideal. So the thing is, fall down is always there, and that fall down is a test by the Lord. Some persons may struggle a lot for a long period of time. They may do the wrong thing in their life. They may stray from the path and go in a direction of sinful life or like that, right? But that's weakness. That's weakness. It's a little different if a person becomes antagonistic and hateful towards pure devotees and the Supreme Lord and so forth, then that becomes aparad and offenses. But, but even the, you know, it's out of ignorance, actually, all, ultimately. <laughs> even the biggest demons are, is, is totally due to ignorance. But they have to pay, they have to pay the price. 
you know. But for a soul who was sincerely trying in this life, and Krishna led him to the pathway where he learned how to approach him through yoga or through bhakti yoga or like this, then that person, he's already shown that this was his ideal. He didn't achieve it. Weakness, right? Like in the Madhurya Kadambani, four different types of, of um, anartas. And one of them is uh, bhakti, um, is um, sukritottama, duskritottama. So arising from uh, sinful activities, some anartas. Some are arising even from pious activities, sukriti, you know, and uh, what? Weakness of heart. Uh, Hridaya Dharabhalyam. Yes, Hridaya Dharabhalyam. Weakness of heart. Krishna even addresses Arjuna. Arjuna, don't have such Hridaya Dharabhalyam. Weakness. This doesn't become you, Arjuna. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, the, the, the topic of this, you know, verse of Uddhava is to express gratitude that the Lord has made this arrangement. No one could ever think enough. So actually, we're very, very close. There's um, in the uh, tenth canto, the story, the pastime of Krishna, you know, leaving the battlefield in, in uh, Kalyavana and Jarashanda, and they're, they were attacking Mathura. And they did so many times, and Krishna defeated them. But now, this time, he brought this Yavana named Kalyavana, right? And he brought huge numbers of soldiers. So at that time, Krishna performed a pastime of running away from the battlefield. Krishna the Ranchor? Yes, Ranchor <laughs> means one who runs from the battlefield. So Krishna ran away, and Kalyavana thought, look at this. Such a coward. And so he ran after him. <laughs> he ran after Krishna, shouting abusive words, you, you coward, you, you know. And Krishna just kept running, running, running. And then there was a cave on a mountainside. Krishna ran into the cave, and Kalyavana saw him from a distance. So then he came, and he ran into the cave. And then Kalyavana, when he was inside the cave, he saw this shape on on the on the ground inside of the cave. And he thought, oh, just see, this cowardly Krishna, he's trying to hide. He's trying to pull some blanket over him, like this, you know, he's trying to hide. Because it, it was very dim. It was dim inside of the cave, very not much light. So then he went and he kicked, thinking it was Krishna. So then, suddenly, what he kicked, there was a very powerful personality who suddenly sat up and looked at him with his eyes. And from his eyes came, you know, the most powerful, fierce fire which burnt him to ashes in a single moment. Scary. So now that person who burnt him to ashes sat up and was looking around and then he saw this effulgent person, Krishna. Who was that person who was lying asleep? Muchakunda. Muchakunda <clears throat> was a very, very powerful Kshatriya king. And although he was from the earthly plane, but he was so powerful that even the demigods, they requested that he should come and fight for them in their battle against the demons. So he fought very, very long time. Finally, the demigods, they were very pleased by him. And they gave him a benediction. What do you want? And what did he ask for? I want to sleep. <laughs> yes, for a long time. I don't want anyone to disturb me. 
And if somebody comes and wakes me up and disturbs me before I naturally wake up, give me the power to burn him to ashes by my sight. Yes, granted. <laughs> so Krishna knew because Muchakunda was actually a very great devotee. He wasn't an ordinary person. He was a very great devotee of Krishna and Krishna knew he's there. And then he arranged for Kalyavana to, <laughs> to be uh, cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then Muchakunda seeing Krishna, he immediately could understand this is my Supreme Lord. Krishna was very fulgent. The whole cave was lit up by his effulgence. And he prayed the prayers of Muchakunda. So there's one verse inside of those prayers of Muchakunda to Krishna, which is cited by our acharyas. And Muchakunda is expressing, um, he said, Oh my Lord, the living entities are always wandering in material existence from life to life from body to body. But somehow or other, after wandering for millions of lives, they now become fortunate and they meet your pure devotee in the course of their wandering. Then he says, this meeting is a sign that the long materialistic wandering journey of the living entity is about to come to an end. So it's true. We have to always understand this from this perspective that we have become very, very blessed and very, very fortunate. And we've been delivered from very fallen position. Prabhupada said every member of this Krishna consciousness movement must always remember how they have been rescued from the most fallen condition and sinful life. Yes. yes. So we always have to remember this. And feel gratitude. So that's some thoughts that I was having. We've expressed that gone a little bit longer because we started later. But there's nothing stopping us. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now uh, we will continue tomorrow with Vilapa Kushumanjali Gorpinanandi Shri Uddhavaji Ki Jai Shri Grantra Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai 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 Shri Radhe Govinda Ki Jai or Pramanandi. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare
Krishna Bhakti Prade Devi Satyavachai Namona Vansha Kalupatarupascha Kripa Sindhu Pevacha Patitanam Pavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo 